WrestleMania 5, once again, just like WrestleMania 4, it emanated from Trump Plaza. I've done my research this time into what Trump Plaza is and where it is, and apparently it's in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So, there we go. Uh, I don't know if it's still there, but it was there at that time. Right, WrestleMania 4 ended with Macho Man Randy Savage winning the World Title Tournament and then with Hulk Hogan's help. However, this show, by this point, one year later, Savage still had the title, but Hogan wasn't his friend anymore because Savage had turned on Hogan and it was all revolving around Elizabeth. And there it is, the tag classic DVD with Savage and Hogan on the front. Now, this is one of the last WrestleManias I ever watched, like, in terms of chronological order. I'd seen all the other ones, but I hadn't seen 5 and 7. 5 and 7 were ones that eluded me all my life. The rest of them I saw them as they happened, but 5 and 7 were ones that was a bit of a problem for me. So this, watching it, I've only watched it two or three times, so this was like quite a fresh experience me watching this. So let's get straight into the card. First match was Hercules versus King Haku. Haku no longer part of the Islanders, he's now by himself, I think he's being managed by Bobby the Brain Heenan as well. And now Hercules, no longer a bad guy, he's now a good guy. Went up against Haku. Oh, I'm not not wrote the results on this on the back of this DVD. I've got the DVD with all the match listings. So, right, who won this match? It's just going to be have to be off memory now, isn't it? Hmm. <laughs> this match was won by. I think Hercules won this match. Um, what can I say about this match? Nothing special. Haku showed that he was a pretty solid wrestler. He, he looks okay, and he was like looking quite trim in these days as well. So I don't know why he didn't get a push towards one of the titles. Although I suppose he didn't really need it, and he was a bit unpredictable. He's apparently a real life badass. So if he didn't want to keep hold of that title, there would be no getting it off him, really, would there? Uh, next match was Akeem and the Big Boss Man with Big, the Big Boss Man making his WrestleMania debut against the Rockers again. Shawn Michaels making his WrestleMania debut, and him and Matt Jannetty put on a great match. And you can really tell that how ahead of the time the Rockers were because they're using the, all these high flying moves, which moves that other teams weren't really using. I remember two years ago talking about uh, the WrestleMania Free Show, where um, what were they called at the time? Tom Zink and Rick Martel's team, anyway, doing a few double team moves, like, fast-paced, and thinking to myself, oh, these guys are really good for the time. Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, only two years later, doing a hell of a lot of better job in this match. Uh, Akeem and the boss man got the win. It was a good little match, and basically the story of the match was that the Rockers were the underdogs, so they were double teaming uh, the bigger guys of Akeem and the boss man. Lots of two-on-one moves, lots of double team moves, lots of uh, isolating the guy, but then at the end of the match, uh, Akeem and the boss man... Overcame them and won the match. Uh, next up, we had Brutus Beefcake versus Ted DiBiase. And I believe Ted DiBiase won this via Million Dollar Dream. I've literally just finished watching this show now, so I don't know why I can't really remember the matches. I guess I just presumed that I'd it'd say the results on the back of the DVD case, although why would it do that? Um, yeah, DiBiase got the win. Next match, we had Bushwhackers versus Jacques and Raymond Rougeau. Now, this one was a. Uh, oh, Bushwhackers debut. It's interesting to see like how Bushwhackers came through in this time and how like like I was saying, this is the first WrestleMania that wasn't one of the boring WrestleManias in my opinion. Because we started getting these fun characters like the Bushwhackers and we started getting that move away from guys like Don Morocco. Uh da -da -da -da. next match. Although the winners of that match again, I'm doing rubbish the air. I can't remember. If I had to get... Oh no, I think the Bushwhackers won it. Oh, yeah, I think the Bushwhackers won that match. Next match, Mr. Perfect versus the Blue Blazer. Now this was a stand-up match in my opinion. Owen Hart versus Kurt Henning. Anytime you get th these two guys in the ring, it's fantastic stuff. Anytime you got either the Hart brothers, Brett or Owen, in the ring with uh, Mr. Perfect, you're going to get a great match. And this was no different. Um, Blue Owen Hart under the Blue Blazer gimmick. I don't know why they couldn't have just brought him in under the Owen Hart name. Uh, maybe because they knew they weren't going to book him strongly, so they just thought, do you know what, we won't damage his character, we'll bring him in under this Blue Blazer gimmick, and then in a few years, when he is ready to break out, then we'll put him under his real name. And that's what they did, I suppose, so fair play to him. Uh, yeah, Mr. Perfect got the win. Very good match, though. I'd, I'd probably the best match on the card, looking over it. Uh, next match, Demolition, Axe and Smash, who are now the tag team champions. Are they the tag team champions? 
It doesn't say here on the back who were the tag team champions. Maybe they weren't. I'm sure they were. Anyway, the demolition Axe and Smash versus the Powers of Pain, who were the Barbarian and the Warlord, and they were with their manager Mr. Fuji, who had just turned them at the last, well, not the last preview, two previews before this, at the the Survivor Series, which was like the second ever Survivor Series in '88. Um, yeah, just this is a big man match for pure meatheads in the ring going at it and I believe the demolition ended up getting the win getting one over on Mr. Fuji next match Dino Bravo versus Ronnie Garvin I remember thinking during this match like I don't understand Ronnie Garvin I don't understand the, the hype around him because I understand that he used to be a bit of a big deal in the NWA especially in the 1980s and I don't see I don't see why he was booked as such a strong contender maybe he had like a lot of uh Political power, or maybe he's just friends with the right people, but I, I don't understand it. And then this match, he was—he had to put over Dino Bravo, who's in no means a great worker. And um, after the match, Ronnie Garvin got to do the oh, good old Garvin stomp on a uh, Frenchie Martin. The Garvin stomp, by the way, is the thing Randy Orton does now, where the guy's down and he goes around stamping on each body part. Bam, bam, bam. Very slow and methodical. Um, next match. Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard... The Brain Busters, just come from uh, NWA, they were da, 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 members of the Four Horsemen, they did the other tag team name there themselves, they were just part of the Four Horsemen. They beat T-Arm, Santana and Rick Martel, which spelled the end of the, uh, of, um, what they call Strike Force, T-Arm, Santana and Rick Martel. Um, this was a good little feud, this feud lasted for ages, I think I mentioned in one of my other videos how like, this feud seems to never end and I don't think I ever did see the blow off match to this and it, to me it just doesn't seem like it ever ended because they didn't have that one big pay per view blow off match that I do believe they should have had um, after this match we've got a Piper's Pit segment with Morton Downey Jr who I have no idea who he is and Brother Love uh, started off with Brother Love coming down as Roddy Piper dressed as Roddy Piper Piper came out and then starts making loads of childish insults on him um, Brother Love and then um, Morton Downey Jr was acting like a right dickhead and, and like one of the things I thought about this is like he's just acting like a twat I don't know if it was just him being a great hero which I think it might have been or the fact that he was just a general dickhead but um, he was like just blowing didn't seem interested while Piper was uh, taking the piss out of um, Brother Love Martin Downey Jr. is just trying to attention so he can throw a cigarette sat in behind him and I'm just like what is he doing this is just a bit weird and another thing is that they had this interview segment in the middle of Wrestlemania and I know it's sort of an intermission sort of thing but it annoys me when these kind of things are on Wrestlemania because Wrestlemania is Wrestlemania it's not sports entertainment mania it's Wrestlemania this is the one show of the year that you can give us a shitload of wrestling matches throw in all the entertainment aspects in terms of celebrity involvement and all that wicked but don't put, give us like a 15 minute interview segment where I was just sat there like oh. <sighs> that was boring that is pretty boring like Sav uh, Savage, Piper did a really good job of being healing, like being himself. And I remember thinking, like, you know what? It just shows how charismatic he was. And he had that movie style look when he came out of the back and the top. And I was thinking to myself, oh, he must have tried to do movies. And he's walking, and he's got his looks. And I was like, oh, he has that movie style look. At. And now I understand why he went to movies. Next match: Jake the Snake Roberts versus Andre the Giant in a weird match that seemed to l just be over very quickly. The special guest referee was Big John Studd, and this. Matches seem to be more about the rivalry between Big John Studd and Andre the Giant than the few, the rivalry between Andre the Giant and Jay the Snake. First of all, you've probably seen our WrestleMania 1 review if you're watching this one. Which is probably about, what, 25 of you have watched all of these videos. Um, I hope not. I hope this number down there is about 200. More than 200 at least. Just 200 is a nice little number I like to win for. Um, yeah. The Under the Giant Big John Stud feud seems to be well was about who, who's the true giant of the WWE, and at the time Andre was the good guy and Stud was the bad guy. But now at this time, this point, four years later, the roles had reversed. John Stud was the good guy, Giant was the bad guy, and Jake Roberts was also feuding with the Giant, and it was sort of like a thing to get Jake over. And I think it was a sort of way to put Andre in a match where he didn't have to do a lot of stuff because they'd have a little bit of a match then Jake the Snake would get the snake out and then Andre would shit it and run off and that's basically what what happened here at one point Jake went for the snake um, DiBiase stopped him then DiBiase tried to steal the snake and run away with it Jake stopped him came back threw the snake in the ring Andre the Giant shit himself and ran off 
Next up, we have the Heart Foundation versus the Honky Tonk Man and the Greg the Hammer Valentine. Um, I remember realising that while I was watching this, that all the way through my childhood, I always believed Honky Tonk Man and Greg Valentine were a tag team. Nowadays, like I was watching this match going, ah, I forgot they even tag team together. So to me, they're not like a, a proper tag team, but I remember when I was a kid, I used to really believe that they were a, like a solid tag team together. Um, yeah, this match... Again, not really much to talk about. Brett was great. This is when the Hart Foundation just turned face. And they ended up getting the win because it, Jimmy Hart, who used to be the manager of the Hart Foundation, was now the manager of Valentine and Honky Tonk Man. He was getting involved with his megaphone and then behind the referee's back, they tried to hit, uh, I think it was Brett Hart with it. Brett Hart ended up getting it, hitting Honky Tonk with it and then pinning him. In later years, we got the Honky Tonk uh, shoot interview where he, he said some not too pleasant things about Brett Hart. Um, I won't go into what they are. In this video, if you want, if you want to know what they are, I'd suggest you search YouTube. You'll find it easily. Just write Honky Tonk Man Bret Hart. But um, yeah, um, Honky Tonk Man laid down for Bret, and I think he's just jealous of the massive push that Bret Hart got and how successful Bret was, rather than and Honky Tonk Man's living off his greatest Intercontinental Champion of all time sort of gimmick when he never really was that great of an Intercontinental Champion. Really, he was just standard in my opinion. Well, actually, no, he's quite good, but he was never like legendary. Um, next up, in the Continental Title match, speaking of the best Intercontinental Champion of all time, and this was the Ultimate Warrior defending the title against Rick Rude. Now, this is a feud that was weird because at the Royal Rumble, they'd done a similar thing to the Piper's Pit segment of this, where they had um, oh, it was something like a body showdown or something like that, a pose down, that's what they called it, a pose, Jesse the Body Venture was pose down. And basically they brought in Ultimate Warrior and he did all of his poses uh, and all that bollocks and then Rick Rude would come in and he'd do all this and all that and then the fans would cheer and boo and then Jesse the Body Ventura said and the winner is and then even though everyone had cheered for the Ultimate Warrior Jesse went Rick Rude and then all the crowd would go boo and you know all that pantomime and good stuff. This is a surprisingly good match and although Ultimate Warrior gets a lot of hate watching this match I was thinking to myself this is his WrestleMania debut I was thinking to myself, do you know what? Ultimate Warrior was awesome. He didn't need to do much, and he what he needed to do, he did it very, very well. He ran down to the ring, he had lots of energy, he had that great steroided up look where like the muscles are just hanging off him and he's got these tassels and he's shaking the ropes and all that. And then he comes into the match and uh Rick Rude's cheating against him. And then at the end of the match, he gets him and he's just about to suplex him, but Heenan hooks Warrior's leg. Rick Rude falls on top of him, and the referee gets the one, two, three. Warrior chases Heenan around the ring, then Heenan and Rude fuck off with the title. Uh, next match, Hacksaw Jim Duggan versus Bad News Brown. Um, this match was pretty lame, to be honest. I don't know why it was so high up the car. Jim Duggan ended up getting the win. That's all I've really got to say about it. I really like Bad News Brown, don't get me wrong, but the match was pretty crap. Um, next up we have the Red Rooster versus Bobby the Brain Heenan. Bobby the Brain Heenan in this short little match proved that he was a better worker at this age than at half the guys in the WWE roster right now because of the way that he acted and the way that he sold. He really helped to make the Red Rooster look like he knew what he was doing in the ring. I'm not saying the Red Rooster didn't know what he was doing in the ring, but Bobby the Brain Heenan made him look like this guy was absolutely destroying him. And he ended the match quickly and he pinned him. Heenan looks like he didn't belong in the ring with him, which is what he was supposed to do. Perfect. Like he did, he did his role well. Would I have put this match on the card? Probably not. Uh, Red Rooster didn't ever become anything in the WWE, so I don't know why this was a necessary match to do, especially so high up the card. Again, it was probably a case of just a piss break match just before the main event, which everyone was waiting for. You're all waiting for. I'm waiting for it because this is all I want to talk about. That right there on the front, Hogan versus Savage for the world title. Miss Elizabeth. Interviewed before it, who are you going to side with? Are you going to side with Hulk Hogan? Or are you going to side with Macho Man? This is the mega powers colliding. They were a tag team and they only got split up because Savage was getting jealous of Hogan and Liz. This is a fantastic case of art imitating life. This is a fantastic case of that because there's all these stories from people who've come out on their shoot interviews and said, I like Macho Man, and I like Liz, but I think he was a bit obsessive over her, and that he used to protect her a bit too much. Apparently the stories that he used to lock her in the locker room so no none of the guys could get to her during his matches because he used to be jealous, that really shows in this one feud where 
Um, Hogan, at one point, was carrying Liz to the back because she was knocked out, and Savage was behind him in the ring like, you fucking son of a bitch, what are you doing with my wife? What are you doing with my wife? I want to fucking knock you out. And then he goes to the back, and then he attacks him in the back. Great stuff. They can take something that's real, that the fans don't know about, because it's got that real sentiment within the guys, they can make it look so good in the ring. And the fact that Hulk Hogan was the man in the WWE at the time, but he hadn't had the title for so long, and now he's going up to, going up against the guy, his be best friend, his former best friend, who's the world champion, and they're arguing over this gorgeous woman, and Hulk Hogan, the perennial good guy, beats him. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic storytelling. Now, this is the thing. That kind of a thing can't be done again because it's already been done and we'll look and we'll say, oh, it's been done, again, done before. We'll complain as wrestling fans. But this one time, this one time that it was done, because it was done so long ago, this is fantastic. This is what WWE need to do. They need to take some real life stuff, mold it into a storyline, and then give it to us like that. They can't just keep giving us stuff that's not really too much of this or too much of that, just boring stuff. This is another reason why I'm really liking the John Cena Kane thing at the time, although I suppose it may be over by the time you watch this video. That's what I've got to say about this show. I want to know what you guys think. Now, I'm not even uploaded WrestleMania 1 yet, so these videos might be getting no views, no comments or any of that, so I'm going to do a big message to you all now. Please, please, please. Drop your comments down below. If you've not seen this show, go find it. Go and watch it. I really do recommend that you watch it, even if it's just for the main event. Go find the main event on YouTube. Come back to this video and let me know what you think of it. Let me know what you think of it, because you can see the promo packages before, and then you can go back and do a bit of research into this. And I'll tell you what, it might take you an hour to watch it all, the match, the promos before, and how it all came to fruition. But it's such a good wrestling education for you, like... For everyone, for me as a wrestling fan, to go back and watch this, and like I said before, I've only seen it two or three times, I was, I learned stuff from this, and like, learned stuff of how they put stuff together in the old days, and like, that was really good, the way they used to slow cook things. <coughs> Please let me know your thoughts on my video down below. Let me know if you've seen it or not down below. Let me know if me making these videos makes you want to watch them or not. Do I portray it in a negative light? Do I portray it in a positive light? I don't know, I'm just talking about how I, how I view it. I, I'm not trying to put any spin on it whatsoever, but what, what impression do you get there watching it? That's all for now. Please keep an eye out for my review of this. WrestleMania 6, which I may watch tonight. I might watch it tomorrow, see how I feel. But yeah, until then, I'm Anwar of Anwar Morrison. You are hopefully a subscriber, and we will see each other very, very soon.